So the two uh, passages we're going to look at in uh, the message um, this morning, first is from Numbers 11, verse 29. Uh, This is the verse where uh, Moses, he responds to Joshua after Joshua hears about these two men, Medad and Eldad, prophesying in the camp. Joshua says, stop them, stop them. Uh, And Moses says in verse 29, are you jealous for my sake? And here's a powerful prayer that we uh, see fulfilled. Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Now, when was that fulfilled? Uh, The second section that we're uh, looking at is Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. Acts chapter 2, 17 and 18 Um, At the coming of the Holy Spirit, this is where God powerfully pours out His Holy Spirit, so creating a new spirit within uh, His people, those who believe and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, It's a fulfillment of this prophecy, Uh, Acts 2, verse 17 through 18. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And so those are the two uh, passages that we'll be uh, looking at in the context of uh, this uh, profession of faith. And as I was preparing uh, for uh, this message, uh, beloved brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, uh, I was reminded, I actually don't remember how I was reminded, but it might seem unrelated, bear with me breeding season of the robins. A robin bird, first time we see that in the spring, it kind of gets you excited that um, spring is around the corner. And then from April through July, uh, it's breeding season. And so the birds, they make their nest. It takes them about two to six days. And then when they're finally ready to lay their eggs, uh, they lay an egg. Uh, Apparently it's one egg a day for a total of three to five eggs. And then the robin sits on these eggs for about two weeks, leaving only for a short time uh, to go and and eat herself. And then the eggs hatch. Uh, I wonder if any of you have seen um, robin, little baby robins in their nests and the mother bird coming to them. You can see these nakedly furry little heads with beaks wide open just saying feed me feed me and then the mother bird comes flying in with this big juicy worm and drops it right into their mouth now what I didn't realize or maybe I did at one point is every time or almost every time baby birds eat they also poop now If you think of them being in the nest for about 14, 15 days, that is a lot of poop. So where does it go? Well, some of you may know this. The mother bird, as the baby bird is getting ready to poop, grabs it with her beak and flies it out of the nest. It's this incredible picture of feed me, feed me, feed me, clean up my mess. Well, I was preparing for this message through uh, the book of Numbers, and as I was reading Numbers 11, and as I saw Moses, uh, the prophet of God, working with this uh, great multitude of people leading them out of Egypt into a promised land, that picture of baby birds constantly saying, Me, 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 I want, I want, I want. Feed me, feed me, feed me. And then, here's a mess, here's a mess, here's a mess, here's a mess. I think it's a good picture for what Moses was experiencing. And it comes to a point in Numbers chapter 11, the passage where we read, where Moses, he says, I can't take this. This is too much. He even says, we looked at this uh, in uh, the context of Galatians, these aren't my babies. Lord, why am I doing this for these people? They're not my babies. Well, the good news this morning is it's not up to Moses to lead the people. It is God who's leading the people. 
Moses is simply his mouthpiece. And when we realize how finite we are and how prone to fail we are, then we begin to understand why Moses' prayerful longing of, Lord, let everybody have this spirit is uh, such a beautiful prayer and then a great fulfillment in uh, Pentecost. And so uh, this morning we're going to look at uh, this passage under this uh, theme, uh, simply a prayer, my Lord empower them. It's going to be a prayer that we're going to end with recognizing this is what we're praying for each one of you as you're doing profession of faith. O oh Lord, empower them. We're going to see the overwhelming task, the prayer, and then the gracious gift. So what is the overwhelming task that Moses is, is faced with in this passage? It's not so much feeding the people, though that's part of what is, is bearing down on him. No, it's getting the people to understand who is the one who feeds You see, the people of Israel in the Old Testament had this incredibly gifted opportunity with God. God was saying, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to give you everything that you need. Trust me. Believe in me. And so God did it. He saved them out of Egypt, bringing them to the promised land. He's providing. He's giving them food. He's giving them drink as they're going through the desert. But constantly, the Israelites are still complaining and grumbling. It's not enough. I want more. This should change. That should change. We have bread, but we want meat. And so what is the overwhelming task that the prophet Moses is faced with? It's getting people to believe that God knows best and that God will give what is best. And so it's in that context, in the context of that overwhelming task that Moses cries out and says, Lord, I can't do this. Now this is where we begin to see a glimpse into the fact that it's not Moses, but it's God working. Because what does God say? He tells Moses, find 70 men from uh, among the people, 70 men who are already um, considered leaders, um, among the people, find 70 men, and then I will take the same spirit that's on you, and I will spread the load. I will divide that spirit over others. And so that's what Moses does. He, as according to commandment of God, it looks like he writes down a list of 70 men, uh, and you can just imagine him saying, okay, I know so-and-so from the tribe of Benjamin, so-and-so from the tribe of Judah, writes out a list of uh, 70 men. Those men are invited to the tent of meeting, and then at the tent of meeting, God pours out his spirit upon them. They begin to prophesy, and it it does say there, uh, and they stopped, but the point is Now, these men will be among the people to speak to them and guide them and tell them God's word. They will join Moses in that overwhelming task. You see, the God who calls and the God who gives us a task is the God who also empowers us to that task. This is made very clear later when Jesus Christ comes to earth and he gives his disciples a task as well. He doesn't just say, go and lead the people of Israel. No, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. I've got a task for you and you're going global. And not just going global, but you're going to make disciples globally. You're going to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're going to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. I'll talk about an overwhelming task as the disciples think, uh, going global. But Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age. Before you go, go to Jerusalem, and I will clothe you with power from on high. And so Jesus promises the same spirit that here in the Old Testament is divided from Moses to 70, gives it to the disciples, and then the book of Acts is the fulfillment of that promise where that spirit begins to fill every believer in Jesus Christ. Giving them 
what they need. But I actually realize I'm getting ahead of myself. The prayer, the second point. Just a brief explanation. The Bible's divided in Old and New Testament. In the Old Testament, this is the time before Jesus Christ, God was at work in the world through his Holy Spirit. But he was at work through specific anointed people. So among the people of Israel, there were a few people that God put his spirit upon them and used them in unique and powerful ways to lead and guide and shepherd the people. So keep that in mind, that in the Old Testament, God is at work through specific anointed people guiding all of the people as we hear Moses' prayer. So there's a little twist that happens in Numbers at chapter 11. You have the 70, they're called to the tent of meeting, but it turns out only 68 show up. Two men remain in the camp. If you want to think of the uh, image of uh, the nest and the mother bird, there's two men still just hanging out in the nest. We're not told why Eldad and Maydad are there. Maybe they get caught up not explained why they're still in the camp. But right where they are, among the people, God's Spirit comes upon them, and they prophesy right there in the camp among the people, among all of the grumblers and complainers, and the people said, we don't want God, we want to go back to Egypt. All of a sudden, right from the middle of him, two men begin to prophesy and to speak God's Word. You can imagine the people in the camp, they're Who's saying this? We expect it from Moses. We expect it from the shepherd, the pastor of the people here. But what's he doing talking like this? Why is he saying things about trusting in God and and here are his ways? That's Moses' job. Let us be us. It creates such a stir that there's a young man that thinks this is, there's something going on here. I need to run back and I need to tell Moses that Eldad and Maydad, they're doing your job. And so he runs uh, to Moses and he, and he tells them what's happened, tells Moses what is happening in the camp. And then Joshua says, Moses, we got to go and stop them. My Lord Verse 28, my Lord, stop them. My Lord Moses, go and stop them. Well, why would Joshua say that? Joshua's saying that because he's concerned, he's nervous that somebody's going to take Moses' place. Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? He's nervous that all of a sudden the people are not going to see Moses as the great one, but they're going to see that the power and the Spirit of God can work in each and every person and through each and every person. And so Aaron says, my Lord, stop them. And then we get that prayer. I love this prayer. It's a prayer of incredible humility and trust, knowing that God has a plan and Moses has a place in that plan, but he's not the plan. God has a, has a great plan to bring goodness and glory and wisdom and life and, and righteousness to all of the world. And God will do that in his own way. And so Moses, he prays, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Stop and pause and think of what Moses is praying. Would that every single person in time of adversity, in time of uh, struggle, in time of joy, in time of suffering, would that every single person would be speaking the words of God, giving glory to God, guiding according to the wisdom of God. Moses is saying, imagine that. 
every single person in the camp with the Spirit of God. Moses was praying that people would be filled and fill the earth, people that could counsel, that could encourage, that could comfort, that could help, that could love, that could care for others, that could challenge and correct others. Moses was praying for the divine empowerment, if I can use our analogy, of baby birds to mother robins. He was praying for people who, whenever they saw mouths wide open, would seek to fill them. And whenever they encountered mess, would be eager to help and clean it up. Moses was praying for what God promised and fulfilled at Pentecost. You see, there's there's an important perspective that's also for our culture that as you think of what it means to belong to a church, it's not just a few office bearers or a pastor kind of leading and guiding. No, to be part of a church, to be a member of a church is to say that I am by faith in Jesus Christ, spirit-filled and empowered to love God and love others. That I'm not here to be a consumer, just to get, and when I'm not getting, complain. No, I'm here to glorify God in the way that I give my life in service to Him. Is Moses' prayer our prayer? Is Moses' prayer your prayer? I know parents, you're praying for your children to be able to come to this point of profession of faith. Is part of that prayer longing to see them empowered to become living members? What would it look like if this uh, church what, and neighborhoods and the city of Toronto, in a place where there's confusion, where there's brokenness, where there's hurting, where people are looking for advice and so often getting very bad advice, what does it look like for God's truth to begin to speak into that world? That's what Moses is praying for. And that's what God fulfilled. That's what God gives. In Eldad and Medad, God gave Moses a glimpse of what could be. O oh Lord, would you put your spirit on all your people, and how great would your name be in all the earth. Joel, he prophesied it. This is um, 900 to 1,000 years later. So think big timelines. But he prophesied a fulfillment of Moses' prayer. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. In other words, there is no exclusion. This this spirit will fill each and every believer of Jesus Christ. You see, what happens in the person of Jesus Christ who comes to earth and dies on the cross, our sins are forgiven so that we have a restored relationship with the overflowing fountain of all goodness. It's almost like connecting a pipe. When you're reconnected with the overflowing fountain of all goodness, what happens? That overflowing fountain of all goodness begins to flow in and out and through you. That's what Jesus said. He said, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said, continuing John 7, about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For yet the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified.
See, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, is to not only know that you are forgiven and loved by God because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, but it's also to know that God will empower you to be life-giving refreshment to those around you. From baby bird to mother bird. Prophets and priests in the lost and confused, broken and hurting world. Mark Justin, Taylor, Martin, Joseph, Priscilla. Do you realize that Moses was praying for you? For you and for every believer. He was praying that by faith in Jesus Christ, the world would be filled with the Spirit of God. He was praying for you, and in your public profession of faith, Moses' prayer is still being answered today. Because what you're saying, you're not just saying, you are saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. I want to follow him. I know that I am forgiven. I'm loved by him. I want him to teach me and comfort me and encourage me. And so, yes, there is a sense where we're always with mouth wide open and heart receiving, turning to God and saying, Lord, fill us. That never changes. But you're also saying, by faith in Jesus Christ, I have something to give. Because Jesus has given me his spirit. 1 Peter 4 says, As each have received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The reality is the spirit is alive in your heart and he's calling you into service to him. To be a prophet, to be a priest, to be a king in this world. It'll look different for each one of you, but it should never be absent from any of you. Now, the reality is, you may not feel like you do. All of us, as we're sitting here, we might think, well, I don't feel like I do, or I don't know what that looks like. Maybe there's some sitting here that think, well, I've got my own sin that I have to deal with. I'm disqualified until that gets taken care of. The answer to all of that is look to Jesus Christ. Don't look at yourself. Look to Jesus Christ. You see sin forgiven and you see yourself empowered, not because of your success or your ability or grace, but because of God's power at work within you. And that's where Moses turns. He says, would that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. So if you don't feel equipped to look, feel equipped, then look to Jesus. Grow, grow in faith. As you find yourself grumbling or complaining, ask How has God led me here? How is God leading me here? And how can I learn to grow and trust in God? Rather than turning and complaining and groaning and mumbling. Grow in hope. This is a hard one, especially in a world where things seem to go wrong. You have a living hope that never dies. And so grow in that hope. So that as you encounter brokenness and hurt and pain, as you encounter hearts that you think there's no hope, grow in hope and recognize that by God's power and grace, He is bringing life and love into this world. And then grow in love. A spirit-filled reality, learning from Jesus what it means to love and what it looks like to love. Remember the baby birds and the mother bird? The church of Jesus Christ, of which you are a part, shall be the healer, the truth speaker, the builder, the peacemaker, the comforter, the counselor, the restorer, the repairer. Not in our own strength, but in the power of God's Holy Spirit, which he gives freely, graciously, and generously 
to all who believe in Jesus Christ and ask him for these gifts. Let none of us join Joshua in saying, stop them. But let all of us pray, Lord, empower them. Fill us with your spirit and may the world see your glory. Amen.